with the roll call. Present. Bruce Here. James Here. Sean Here. 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 Thank you. Would everyone stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Ready? Begin. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would like to make clear for the record of this meeting, and it should be reflected in the minutes, that at least a portion of this Planning Commission meeting is conducted pursuant to California Government Code Section 54953, and that Commissioner Alderetti will be participating in this Planning Commission meeting by speakerphone. In accordance with the Brown Act, each teleconference location has been identified in the notice and agenda for this meeting. Please bear with me while I briefly go through some special procedures required by the Brown Act. I would now like to request that Commissioner Alderetti respond to the following questions. Commissioner Alderetti, can you hear me well? Yes. Were you able to hear our proceedings on this end up until now? Do you have a copy of the agenda for this meeting? I do. Is the agenda posted at the location where you are at? Is your location reasonably accessible to the public such that any member of the public could participate in this teleconference from your location if he or she wished to do so? Yay or nay? <laughs> oh, lost Eric? Yes. Did you hear my, my one item there? Is your location... Okay, is your location reasonably accessible to the public? So, okay, yeah, okay. Is there any member of the public there with you who would like to participate in the public comment portion of this meeting or otherwise address any agenda item for this meeting? There is not. Okay. I would now like to ask that any member of the Planning Commission speak up at this time if such commissioner has not been able to clearly hear Commissioner Alderetti. Hearing no comment, the record should reflect that all commissioners present have indicated that they were able to hear Commissioner Alderetti clearly. I would, I would next request that any commissioner, including Commissioner Alderetti, speak up at this time if such commissioner has any reason to believe, based on voice recognition or otherwise, that the person representing himself to be Commissioner Alderetti is not truly so. Hearing no comment, the record should reflect that no commissioner has expressed doubt that Commissioner Alderetti is participating by teleconference along with planning commissioners present here. I would now like to advise the Planning Commission and the Secretary that any votes taken during teleconference portion of this meeting must be taken by roll call. Uh, and so we've already done, we did, <coughs> done the roll call. Unless we do it again. We, we don't need to do it again, correct? Okay. Well, this is a portion for public comments. Does any, does a member of the public have any public comments on non-agenda items? If so, you may fill out a request to speak form with the secretary and after introduction, have three minutes to speak unless an extension of time is granted by the chairman. So the first item of business is a consent calendar. Yes. Ah, oh, yes, we do have a presentation, thank you. Presentation of the Police Department, Commander Ken Minsky. See why we were waiting for you, Ken? Okay. I'm still waiting to find out what exactly happened. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll be the second person to know. Probably about the eighth. <laughs>
Now I can come here and give you a presentation and be a talking head, or it was my understanding that you guys had quite a few questions that you were looking for clarification on. And so it's my job today to try to make sure that you have no more questions after we're done today. Is that, are we on the same page? Or did I get something screwed up? Well, uh, Commander, we had a couple ABC license items come up. Mm -hmm. uh, one was a couple months ago, I think. Mm -hmm. And so there was some question on the crime in the area, and I think that the the idea was how 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 that crime is is uh, tabulated, et cetera. I okay. didn't personally particularly have any questions, but I think I think Commissioner Mill may. And so For, we'll just we'll start with that. We'll Perfect. start with that incident. Uh, I want to go back a couple months. Uh, there was a, a liquor license that was proposed. Our CUP was proposed for a restaurant on Fifth Street, just uh, east of Harbor, and it falls within the Santa Anita, uh, the Santa Anita Gang and Junction area. Mm -hmm. uh, the department, the the police uh, recommendation was that, that the crime is below. Um, what, what we would consider to be a problem. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that a few of us couldn't understand how we can go to the courts and get an injunction saying that crime is so bad in this area, we need an injunction against this, but then we could come here. And I was just thinking that, well, what about the lawyers for these, for these folks in this area? Couldn't they come and say, well, they're saying crime isn't bad according to this report, but then we go to the court. So could you kind of explain sure. how we would look at it from? So uh, everybody has a map we've just given you. And if you were to look at grid 65 over on the far west end, that's probably the area we're talking about, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Fifth, just east of Harbor. So in grid 65, we go over here to the paperwork that you guys just received. No, they do, I just gave it to yeah. you. And you look at the policing grid, which is the second column over. And then we can just scroll down until we hit 65. You'll see 66 is ranked 24, 67 is ranked 25, 65 is ranked 27. What we're talking about here is the amount of incidents that occurred. It's the total volume of incidents that occur in a geographic policing grid. Now, somebody else I heard had asked, how did these grids come about? I would absolutely love to tell you I know that answer. However, they've been here for the 30 years that I've been here. And when I asked my dad, who was here 28 years before me, he said they were here when he was here. <laughs> we do and have moved around the geographic policing districts. So we have Northeast, we have Southeast, we have South Coast, we have, so we have the West End. And over time, we have moved them. But the geographic policing grids have not changed in at least 30 years that I'm positive of. And the one main reason that we don't change those policing grids is so that we can not only look for ABC licenses, which is kind of on the back burner, but we keep these crime, inf the information pertaining to the specific areas, we can stay consistent. And we know that grid 186, which is here and here, it's consistently very high in activity. We can tell you that grid 165 is very, very high in activity. It's always high in activity, and these are the reasons why. But the policing grids, they never change. They're always consistent. So when you look back and you say, why is for a gang injunction? How is it that crime can't be quite as bad there? And we're saying it's not so horrible. When you go to the court and you talk about gang injunctions, you're talking about a lot of specific types of crime. You're talking about a lot of specific gang types of crime. You're talking about violent assaults. You're talking about a lot of street robberies. You're talking about gang activity involving intimidation of street vendors. And you can go and prove certain types of activity in these areas and attribute a majority of the activity to the gangs. And then when we look at our stats, 
And then we go to the district attorney's office and we work with them. The district attorney's office is actually the entity that decides where they want to do injunctions. And we facilitate that process. What else can I answer for you about that? I know it's not the whole answer that you're looking for, but it's, it's a conglomeration of a whole bunch of activity that goes on there. What you guys see, when we look at police incidents, we're talking about every single type of call for service that we get. Overall police activity. Okay. Sir? So when, like you say, rank number one or grid 165, does that mean it's like the most incidents in town? Okay, so let's look. Let's find grid 165. Civic Center. 165. Right, right where I see where it is. Right? It's, so we're talking about the area directly north of First Street and the direct the area directly east of Flower. Yep. Why do we think grid 165 is the highest reporting area that we have? The homeless in this in this city. Homeless, center. crimes and public disorder. A lot of politicians. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't me, I didn't say that. <laughs> so generally what you'll find uh, again and something for you to take into consideration is we have 1,707 incidents that occurred within that policing grid. We don't, dis we don't separate what is officer-initiated activity or what is activity that was called into us. It's a lump sum. So in the Civic Center, perfect example, we have six officers that are permanently assigned to do nothing but work in the Civic Center. I would expect that to be one of the highest policing grids in the city, otherwise the county isn't getting its money's worth. Thank you. Okay. That makes sense. And if you look at grid, if you look at the number two rank, grid 186 is predominantly one of our busiest areas overall. For years and years and years, it has been. Why? Because it is, most, it is one of the most densely populated grids in the city. And crime, of course, does coincide with population density. <clears throat> well, what do you got, <clears throat> boss? Let me let me jump in on this. So one of the issues I, I've heard myself and some of my colleagues talk about when we receive the reports, the staff reports for the CUPs, the CUP by nature being a discretionary action. So we're up here deliberating, trying to say, okay, well, number one, should we approve this use? And if we do, perhaps maybe there's a condition or two that should be on there or not be on there. And I think that when we see the stats that are in the staff report, they're, they're of a certain level, you know, as you're saying, all incidences from, from the smallest things to the biggest things. So if we're looking at, um, you know, for instance, the example that Commissioner Mill brought up with the um, restaurant on Fifth Street, mm -hmm. I don't think we're really, I don't wanna say we're not concerned, but it just doesn't apply as much when we're talking about vendors being shaken down or, you know, jaywalking, you know, unless it's a drunk guy jaywalking at 2 a.m. or something. <laughs> so, but with that being said, I think, at least for me, I'll just say for myself, I would love to see when we do these, some sort of, I guess, kind of sp <coughs> I guess specifics as far as, you know, for instance, if there was any incidences that would make sense for the commission to know. So for instance, if we know that the, the parking lot in the back, <clears throat> there was, you know, there's been a couple of fights. I think it would be in your guys' best interest to let us know that so we could say, in case it hasn't been brought up yet by staff, which it 99% of the time would be, but if it wasn't, one of us could say, well, you know, maybe we can use some lighting in the back. We'd like to condition it to have some additional lighting. And I think that if we know what kinds of inc incidences, not just simply it's ranked, you know, fourth out of 100 and something grids, but rather, oh, by the way, here's just a couple of juicy ones that have happened here at site. Because some of the incidences, for instance, if a car crash happens at 4th and Main, I'm not going to blame Starbucks for it. I'm pretty sure it was just two, two cars that hit each other. Probably not Starbucks, it's probably not Teresa's Jewelers, it's just it's an incident. But if someone calls you guys in, what do they do? They say, well, I'm in front of Starbucks. I mean, and it's a call for service to Starbucks. Right. So I, I, I guess my concern is just simply having some specifics, not, not every single thing. I'm not mm -hmm. asking for like of a you know, thousand incidences, give us every single one. But again, just from your guys' good judgment to help us understand if we were to move forward with an approval, what kind of conditions would be best suited for the site, or at least for us to be most aware of? So, 
I'll ask back a couple of questions, and then I think I can talk about some of the complexities involved. Okay. When you talk about how many, or talk about incidents that you guys should know about, how far back do you think that I should go? That's a good question. And let's assume that I look at five years. Okay. Let's just take that. So if I was to take five years, then I look at even in grid 65, right? Uh, 444, five years, I'm looking at 2,000, over 2,000 calls <clears throat> for service in that five years. Yeah. That becomes incredibly difficult for me. Mm -hmm. But part of your point about Starbucks really falls into what I believe law enforcement's biggest hurdle is uh, when we talk about ABC licenses. Starbucks was a perfect example. The guy got into a car crash in front of Starbucks. If, by some freak chance, he got his super grande latte frappuccino thing and it was too hot, and he, was, he, he left the parking lot and it was too hot and he spilt it in his lap and that's what he, that's what he crashed. Right. If the cop says, where were you at? Where did you get your Starbucks from? Was it here? Should we attribute it to the Starbucks as the reason why? Should we try to hold them accountable to say, you really ought to tell your people not to drink and drive with hot coffee, right? Whether my officer asks that question or not, I'd like to think that they will, but I'm not sure. Right. When we talk about a lot of incidents, and it's what makes alcohol establishments so incredibly difficult for us, how do I attribute activity that occurs in and around a location to the location. We talked about a guy who's walking home at night who's drunk. If the guy left bar A and walked down the street six blocks and then got hit by another drunk driver, is it the bar's fault that they overserve the guy? I don't know. If the guy's walking home and then he passes out and hits his head, do we attribute it to the bar? If the guy's not drunk, went over, had a drink, watched the football game, had a good time, decided to, wa uh, to walk home, and a couple gangsters drive up and rob him. Do we attribute that back to that location? And it makes it incredibly difficult for us to say what we should and what we shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about ABC licenses like this, and these people are coming in and they, they, they want these things, it is so imperative, at least on my side, to be able to have a common platform for everybody all the time. Right. If it turns out that uh, there's an LUC coming through, or a CUP coming through you guys, generally it comes to my office as well. It'll go to Bill McGovern, everybody knows Bill. It goes to Bill and then it will come to my office. And what he'll do is he'll say, hey listen, I need you to look at this, are you aware of any issues? And so then I'll run the location, but I'll run the grid, and I'll run the location, and I'll see if there are any things that I feel like I can fairly attribute to the location. Like, if a bar, and uh, I can think of one off the top of my head, if a bar that I know of was to change ownership, the next owner that came in, I would say in our documentation, please, I need better lighting in the parking lots. I need you to make sure that there are security guards that work this parking lot during these times because I know there's problem A, B, and C that I continually can attribute to that. You would expect to see that from my office. But if I don't see anything that I believe I can fairly attribute, then I will probably remain silent. Well, and, and I appreciate you saying all that. I, I just, I've got to admit, in the time that I've served on the commission, I haven't seen any of the CUP reports that have had that sort of specificity. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that means, hey, you, you've looked at them and said, there isn't anything based on what you're right. describing, which makes absolute sense. But there wasn't anything that really rose to that level for you to say, hey, you know, please include that in the report. The other thing is, uh, years and years ago, we would come to you guys and you would get various different conditions. 
Entity A, we would say, needed condition A, B, and D. Another place that might be across the street would come before you guys, and we would recommend B, D, E, and F. And so there was no consistency. But when we redid all of the stuff for the new codes that we put in, we put in consistency into everything. I didn't get everything I wanted when that law came in, but I got a lot. And a lot of the things that are in there now, which are bare minimum, are the things that I used to have to fight for all the time. What else do we got? Are there any other questions from the commission? No, I, I appreciate you. I mean, I don't really have a question. I just want to make a comment, but I appreciate you coming out because I was one of the ones that, one of the commissioners who had concerns, like how do, how do the same thing as, as Phil, is how, how are these uh, projects, or everyone that I was seeing, every ABC, how, there's there's never one denial or never one that we were there, that we were seeing that there were any general police concerns about mm -hmm. an ABC license. So I said, how how is that possible? So I appreciate you coming in and explaining that. I think it's a little bit clearer for me um, on what your process is, how, what you do, how you go about it. So I, I guess if if we would have a problematic location, then we will know about it because you actually would be <coughs> providing that. If you guys don't know about it, I didn't do my job. Okay, very good. That has to be on me. I, I think that answers some of our concerns mm -hmm. in the sense that, again, it's probably just the absence of it, which, is, again, is not always a bad thing. It's good that there aren't those level of incidences, but I think we were all sharing that concern because two of my colleagues had known about this particular restaurant and felt that there you know, was an incident that may or may not have been attributed to that site, right. and that became a concern, and so the thought was, well, if it's not in the report, someone must have missed it. What's going on? You know, the world's falling apart sort of thing. Right. But I appreciate you coming down and explaining to us, you know, the, the levels of review that goes through. So I think I at least can say for myself, yeah. it gives us a little more comfort knowing that something's not just going to slide by or, you know, the subsequent meeting, oh, the item's back because, yeah, we forgot to tell you about A, B, C, D, and E. So, again, thank you for that I hope that doesn't happen. Mr. Mill? <laughs> Actually, he, he did remind me of that. This, mm -hmm. Just wondering how because he said something that slipped through is again this particular restaurant not maybe th not this particular owner but this particular restaurant was actually the restaurant where the guy had sat and had all those pops he drank 30 beers in an hour and got in the car and killed the people the over kids served the crashed right. and killed people right so i think that was one of our questions how, how how do we not i mean the only reason i think we knew about it up here is because i mean i live over there so i remember it happening and so would that not be something that, that would be brought to our attention? Is it because that's a prior owner, so we're not going to – and I don't think it's – we should hold the new guy responsible for the prior owner's bad, bad deeds. But. Right. So this would be my thoughts on that. If owner X, who had issues in the past, if owner X came before you guys again, as part of our due diligence – we should put forward that you should know owner X had this problem and this is what happened. I would not ever truly attribute conduct to a location. I would contribute or attribute conduct to management and to the personnel. I guess, and I need to step in here um, because when you approve a CUP, you don't approve it for the owner you approve it for the location, and it will run with the land for as long as that CUP remains active. So you probably have a heavier responsibility because a gentleman can have his, or, or female business owner, can have their license um, removed or revoked for misconduct or for whatever reason, but it will, the CUP will continue to run with that location. So we really have to be concerned about physical things um, that are happening in the area, lighting, parking, safety issues. True. But their issue dealt with something that occurred off-site. And you can't, I, I can't, and I, well, I won't in good conscience hold activity that occurs off-site against the actual location. No, and, and, and you can't. Right. At, 
Right. Because it doesn't even have anything to do with that particular location. Commissioner Bauer? Well, I think therein lies the tension that we have. Is sure. Because we saw this location that had a certain reputation, and we were concerned. We have a new owner. Now, they could present themselves as a new owner, but they could well be in cahoots with the prior owner. And so we, and we don't know that. All we know is this prior location had this bad reputation, and so we have to be careful in that situation. In, in this last situation we were talking about, I think we all sort of smelled or thought perhaps it was a situation where this new owner was perhaps in cahoots with the prior owner. We don't know, but you know, we not also need to know that information that's attended with that location so that we can be we can address that concern, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm trying to see how to get you where you want to be. Because um, I understand what you're saying. You don't want to attribute a certain location to a prior owner. I mean, that's not fair to a new owner, but at the same time, we have to be sensitive to the fact that certain locations just have bad reputation, you know, and people like, that's the party restaurant, and, mm -hmm. you know, the new place pops up, you know, it doesn't matter. So let me see if I re remember this right. You guys are a lot closer to this incident than I am. The, the request came in for a change of the ABC license. Yes. Right? The request didn't come in to alter the CUP because there could already be that there. We had already given a CUP and allowed for that conduct. Is it that correct? Expired. It had expired in that. The CUP had in expired. That instant it had expired because the the it had lapsed it had lapsed i'll have to think about how we might be able to do a better job uh, it's a one-off i mean i understand uh -huh. your dilemma you don't want to do this for every location because that's a mountain of work that ne usually is unnecessary but there's got to be some way to address the concern in this scenario that we're talking about I can take that to try to figure out something uh, that might be able to help you make more informed decisions. I, I mean, th in this particular instance, it, it was an egregious. I mean, it was specific, and you could say it happened off. It happened in the crosswalk, you know, in front of the restaurant. Mm -hmm. As the guy who was drinking in that restaurant drove his car and ran over the family right. in, the, in the crosswalk. So I mean, yeah, it happened off site, but. I mean, it's not like uh, he. There was a guy at the restaurant, and he was walking down the street, and some guys mugged him, and you, you, we can't. But there was a guy who got hammered at the restaurant, and then killed. It's it's directly attributable to the restaurant, right. and I and I'm almost positive, if I remember right, we went back, and and that was there were charges that were filed uh, pertaining at the restaurant, and that's one of the reasons why that guy couldn't operate anymore. Um, so let me try to figure out what else we might be able to do for one-offs like this that are slightly different uh, to give you guys a little more information. I'll talk to Bill. We'll try to figure something out. Son, Mr. Question? Chair, if I may offer uh, some food for thought to the Commission and maybe for our colleague from the Police Department. I, I have worked in several cities where, especially the city where uh, Sunset Strip is located where, and Santa Monica Boulevard with many nightclubs and bars. And in those cities, we worked very closely with the law enforcement unit. And we discovered that those locations are always going to be attracting because those are party locations. And um, they were important for the cities. Uh, financial situation to continue attracting uh, visitors for the, that particular purpose. And the, the, the challenge that the planning department there and the, uh, and the uh, law enforcement had was how do we maintain order and, 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 and safety at the same time. And we discovered in our analysis that it had a lot to do with the operator and the owner and the management of the process and not so much the location. We came uh, with a process that was aside from the land use process, and I'm not completely sure exactly whether or not we have a similar process here that for certain uses such as nightclubs, bars, and very popular restaurants where alcohol is served in, conjun in conjunction with food, 
we would uh, ask a, a registration of the business manager and with a, with a background check and with the different types of information that we would give to the police department. And if they passed it, we would also uh, um, uh, verify that the manager is qualified to operate that so that we would separate the CUP process from the actual operational issues that were always in the center of it. I think the police department could verify that the management of the establishment is really the, the place where it happens and where they can get the best or the worst cooperation. That was the process we came up with. The following city I worked with, we established the same procedure and it worked very well when we wanted to create an arts and entertainment district where we knew we would get people who are under the influence walking around and they might do funny things. We wanted the establishment to at least be responsible. Maybe we can look at a process like that with the police department and offer something to the planning commission in the future. So uh, in response to that, we do have a process that does look very, very similar, similar to that. If we ever get around to going forward with the entertainment permits, the specific conduct at, at this bar that causes us problems it's not so much that we sit there and have dinner, it's that we sit there and have dinner and then we drink. And then there's some live entertainment and then we drink more. And if we in fact, and a lot of our locations transition from eateries to bars to nightclubs. And when we decide that they transition, the entertainment permit processes, procedures, much like you have articulated, come into play. And for 18 months, we argued amongst the city as to what that entertainment permit should look like, and we've had it. And if we simply move forward and use the entertainment permit, I think it will speak to many of the things that you're discussing. Any other questions for Commander Gminski? Can you elaborate? You were saying that the entertainment permits per what was discussed a couple of years back with the revisions to the overall policy, none of, the, none of those entertainment permits have been issued yet? There are several that have been issued, that but been not issued. the volume that okay. need to be issued. In other words, there are folks that qualify to needing one per our, our law and our code that just haven't obtained it yet? Many. Okay. Because for a second I thought you said none had been issued. I thought, no, no. Wow, that's we a have, long time. We have a okay. handful. Okay. And I think that if you were to go anywhere in this city on a Thursday, Friday, or Saturday night, you'll see that we know how to party in this city. We have a lot of establishments that cater to that activity and are uh, doing very, very well. They need to have entertainment permits. They need to be regulated. Quick question, when's the 2015 information going to be available? Because this is 2014. I would say we ought to be able to have it done by March 1st. Yeah, probably March 1st. Our computer guy will see how he sits. I tried to get response times out of him three weeks ago and I'm still waiting. So uh, I'll try to have that to you by March 1st. Great, thank you. Any other questions or anything you want to add? If there are ever any questions or concerns, you guys have any needs of anything, please feel free to let me know. I'll come down and try to help in any way I can, any time I can. What did I do? He was ordered another drink. That's yeah, I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah. Do they put this in the bar? Thanks, Commander. Thank you very much. You guys have a wonderful rest of your evening. Appreciate it, Ken. Okay. Thank you, Karen, for catching my order out of order there. I'm so used to the consent calendar being right away that I jumped the gun. First item of business is a consent calendar. Do we have a motion to approve items on a consent calendar? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Motion carries unanimously with Commissioner Alderetti um, on the teleconference. Do any of the commissioners have anything to disclose that is on tonight's agenda? Seeing none, I guess we'll move forward. Okay. The next item is the Planning Commission bylaws amendment, and there's recommended action. Is there a presentation on this? Further presentation? We'll give you a brief presentation on this one. Um, as you can see on page four of your guidelines, we only addressed one issue, but um, there was quite a bit of discussion about um, abstention, and perhaps we needed to clarify um, the council's policy. Um, and we have revised your section so that you are consistent with council policy, which will then give you the, the ability and the right to um, abstain if you had a conflict that was not a conflict that was directly related to the um, state code. Uh, it does require you, however, to state the reason for your abstention. So that's the only change. Okay. Now it says we have an action. Does that mean we're taking a vote on moving this forward, or what's our next uh, step? Yes. Is there any further discussion by any commissioners, questions, comments, or a motion? I have one question. Yes, sir. Under the commissioner, commission officers, um, what happened to the HRC? I didn't see any. Maybe I didn't. Maybe I missed it. But the historic the, resources commission. The question is regarding the um, bylaws for the HRC. No, regard, regarding the bylaws for the planning commission. With, they, respect to, oh. with respect to selecting a commissioner to represent, to be representative on the HRC. So that would be, be done in July as well. But it would be, no, a, I think he wants to represent the bylaws. I didn't ask, I didn't see it in the bylaws. It's in the charter? Yeah, it's, it's in the charter, yeah. it's in the charter the yes. Okay. Yes, the requirement that, um, that the uh, planning commissioner serve on the HRC? Is that what right. your question is? Yes, that is in the charter. It's not part of our bylaws. Okay. Why would that be just out of curiosity? Because you're, you're talking about the election of the, the uh, vice chair and the, and the chair. That's right. also, that is also in the in charter. The charter. Right. That's a charter it's in issue. The charter. Yes. But it's also here in the bylaws. Yes. We So I'm just wondering why you We did select. we put it's in these bylaws to dis, to tell you how to do it. Um, but it's the dead the deadlines, the times of the election are specifically stated in the charter. If you'd like to add a section here that in July you would also appoint a commissioner to serve on the historic resources commission. That's fine. For consistency, why not? I, I don't understand. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. For consistency, I would say, why not do that? Sure. Okay. okay. Great. Now, is that something we can add at this time, since be part of the motion? motion? We're going to make a motion with the with, the with that. Um, sure. Our suggestion would be that it would be added under number eleven, Correct. commissioner officers Correct. and representatives, Agreed. and then D section D, and then section D. Or is it B or would it be? 11D. 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 Yeah, 11D. 11D. Yeah. Subsection D. Yeah, that's fine. Before we take a motion, is there any other questions or additions to add to what we just talked about? You want to make a motion, Mark? I'll make a motion that we uh, approve the bylaws. Um, with the amendment that we also uh, update the commissioner officers section 11 with 11D to include the HRC commission, uh, the commission's selection of the HRC uh, representative. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
Motion carries unanimously. Uh, Commissioner Alderetti is uh, with us on the teleconference call. This is a time and place for the public hearing and items number two, which is conditional use permit number 2015-26, strategic plan number 3.3 comma two, okay? Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Let me, let me read this whole script and then I'll sure. hang on one second so I do this correctly. If you wish to address the Planning Commission, please file a request to speak form with the Secretary. Comments are limited to three minutes unless an extension of time is granted by the Chairman. The action of the Planning Commission is final following consent of the City Council unless if allowed by the Santa Ana Municipal Code. An appeal to the City Council is filed with the Clerk of the Council and a copy is sent to the Planning Commission within 10 days from the date of the Commission's action or unless set for public hearing by the City Council. You're on. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission. Up for discussion before you is conditional use permit 2015-26 to allow for a major wireless facility at 4501 West MacArthur Boulevard. Verizon Wireless is requesting approval of a conditional use permit to allow for the construction of a 60-foot high major wireless facility disguised as a eucalyptus tree at the site. The Ancillary equipment is, is proposed to be located within a eight foot high CMU block, uh, CMU block enclosure. And to help screen the facility, the applicant is proposing to plant two 36 inch box eucalyptus trees and to plant decorative vines and shrubs along the base of the enclosure. The site is located on the north side of MacArthur Boulevard to the east of the Santa Ana River along the city's boundary with Costa Mesa and Fountain Valley. The property is in the M2 Heavy Industrial Zoning District and is surrounded by industrial uses to the north, south, a bus terminal to the east, and commercial uses to the west across the Santa Ana River. Here's an aerial image of the site. The a uh, major wireless facility is proposed to be constructed to the north of the existing two-story public storage building. Uh, the building is approximately uh, 130 feet uh, back from MacArthur Boulevard with the major wireless facility being set back approximately 270 feet. As you can see from the site plan, the enclosure and major wireless facility is going to be located to the north of the existing building and is depicted there in the yellow rectangle and the two trees that they're proposing to plant are going to be to the west of the facility to help screen it uh, from Santa Ana River Trail users. In addition to the new trees, the applicant is also going to be relocating two trees that are where the existing facility, where the proposed facility is going to locate, also to the west of the facility to help with screening. Here's an elevation of the facility. Um, Again, it's proposed to be disguised as a eucalyptus tree with the branches um, seven feet above the max height of the antennas and the equipment enclosure being um, screened with landscaping and shrubs. Here's a photo simulation looking to the northwest from MacArthur Boulevard. You can see the proposed uh, mono eucalyptus there being screened by the existing two-story building and blending in with the existing trees along the site and also along the Santa Ana River Trail. Here's another photo sim looking to the northeast. Again, the proposed mono eucalyptus is going to be screened and blend in with the existing eucalyptus trees on the site and along the Santa Ana River Trail. And this photo sim is looking south from the Santa Ana River Trail with the proposed mono eucalyptus there in the center, the proposed two trees there just to the west of it, and the existing trees along the uh, trail and on site there. The project complies with all the major wireless facility standards of the Santa Ana Municipal Code. Uh, the facility is going to provide enhanced coverage to the southwest sector of the city and the design is going to incorporate screening and landscaping to help screen it from public view. 
Based on analysis provided in the staff report, staff recommends the Planning Commission approve conditional use permit 2015-26 as conditioned. That concludes my presentation. Are there any questions for staff? Commissioner Becerra. Um, first of all, good presentation. Uh, I like the additional trees to try to kind of help um, camouflage it. I mean, these things are hard to camouflage as it is. Um, one question, though, just from more of a procedural standpoint. So we've got those two trees being proposed that will help mask it somewhat. Um, I guess, do we have anything built in to where, let's just say this trees, you know, something happens, the wind blows them down or something. Is there anything that obligates them to replace them or... In other words, I would just hate to see the trees put in, they look great, and then all of a sudden something happens. Because there's a lot of language here, if I'm reading this correctly, about maintaining the actual facility. But is, there, is there any way that we could word it, or is there something maybe already in here that would allow for us to ensure that we maintain the landscaping that you guys are proposing? Sure. Uh, we don't have anything in the report itself, but all the landscaping provided for on the site is covered actually in the in the zoning district standards that require uh, the landscaping be maintained. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thanks. Do we have any written communication on this item? Is there any member of the public that wishes to speak? The applicant, perhaps? Good evening. My name is Mari Hager. I work for Core Communications on behalf of the client of Verizon Wireless. And I'm here to answer any questions that you have. I think staff did a really good job in basically summing up the project. And I do also just want to add that there will actually be a total of four trees. We are installing two new eucalyptus trees, but in, plant, in um, installing the facility, we will be having to remove two 30-foot tall trees. And so we will be relocating those. And we will be relocating them so that we're in uh, the planter that is along the Santa Ana um, Path. So it'll actually provide for more screening along that area, which is probably the most exposed, um, and um, which is, I think, a very positive thing given from um, MacArthur. It's very heavily screened. It's over 250 feet set back from the road, and um, it's it's almost, you know, it's very stealth and very screened. So I think that the the facility overall will be very much uh, screened from the public. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Any questions, applicant? I guess we're good. Thank Thanks. you. I'll bring it back to the commission for discussion, a motion. A vote. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Becerra. I, I appreciate uh, how this came to us. I like the, the landscaping. I like what staff has, was able to work out with the applicant. With that being said, I'd like to make a motion to adopt a resolution approving CUP number 2015-26 as conditioned. Do we second. have a second? Second. Commissioner Becerra. Yeah. Uh, we have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. With Commissioner Alderetti via telephone. Okay. That ends the business calendar. We have a work study session on synthetic turf design guidelines. You have 30 seconds. Thank you. Here we go. Good evening, um, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. Uh, tonight we're here before you as a follow-up from a, a prior meeting, so we're going to be looking at the landscape guidelines as it relates to synthetic turf. So as a quick reminder, back in January, we, you were presented with the Water Efficiency Landscape Ordinance and Guidelines, and um, you recommended approval, and that moved on to Council. They adopted that in February. But one of the items that you wanted us to bring back to you was some guidelines on the synthetic turf. So um, as a recap, there is new state law that was initiated in October of 2015 that reiterated that cities have to, uh, that we cannot be unreasonable in our limitations of synthetic turf. Um, it did not, uh, it, provided we don't prohibit it, we can still uh, create some guidelines. And so that's what we'll be discussing tonight. So as um, a little bit of focus, the area on the left uh, is, of course, the private property. It's behind the sidewalk. And that's going to be the focus of our discussion tonight on the private property um, as opposed to the parkway. 
So I'm going to walk you through right now our existing synthetic turf guidelines that were put together back in 2009. Um, Why won't you address? I'm sorry. I didn't well, our synthetic that. guidelines, well, um, as you might be aware, the public uh, right away in the parkway is under the um, auspices of the Public Works Agency. Tig Higgins is here in case we want to talk about that any more. Um, but tonight's focus, for the most part, is on the private property. So we'll, as we go through the presentation, you'll see the, the, um, the, 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 the slight the difference. What Melanie is stressing is that what's uh, within the purview uh, and the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission and the Planning Division is only private property, not the public right of way. So um, uh, once again, these are the existing synthetic turf guidelines uh, that were uh, put together in 2009. So the primary one is that the synthetic turf is limited to 50% of a front yard landscape area and that it, it reiterates, too, that it's not permitted in a parkway. And that's under the purview of Public Works, as we just mentioned. Uh, this, one of the second parts of the guidelines is that it goes over some best practices, and um, including the blade length or the height, uh, which needs to be a minimum of one and one-fourth inch. Talks about having a permeable weed barrier and a minimum three inches of crushed stone sub-base to allow for um, percolation and a permeable surface. It talks about that the installation needs to be by a contractor with a valid license. And um, currently, we also require that a landscape plan be submitted for review by the city to assure that it meets the standards, but with no fee. And the guidelines also talk in terms of it needs to be maintained at all times. Um, another part of the conversation, just for context, and this is in, uh, for single family residents, is that for the R1 zone, um, it requires some basic landscaping, and that is one 24-inch box canopy tree, f uh, six five-gallon shrubs, and ten one-gallon shrubs. So you can imagine this is um, more germane for a new home. So when we have a new single-family house, that's the minimum that they need to um, uh, provide. And um, But it's also something that is supposed to be maintained for existing single-family residences. So here's an example uh, on Fairmont, and it's where you have a blend of 50% of synthetic turf. Uh, the remaining area has a tree, as you can see, a mature tree at this point, has shrubs and, um, and ground cover. So that would be the image of uh, what, what our standards, um, the goal is. Here's another example where there's probably less than 50% of synthetic turf, and there's a mixture of, uh, they've got one, two trees on their particular property, and a mixture of um, permeable rock and uh, landscape material. So um, in coming forward with you today, uh, what we would like to propose for consideration and for dialogue is that we actually maintain our 50% maximum for the visuals that you just saw. Uh, and but we do rec recommend that one of the technical items that be changed and that that the turf blade length be a minimum of one and one half versus one and one fourth. And the reason for that is we're finding that that's um, the, the, the taller blade um, helps in durability and also to encourage a natural look. And we did a little comparing with some other cities and did a little research on that. Um, one thing we are proposing moving forward is actually to no longer require a landscape plan for review. A um, couple of reasons for that is that we were finding that a lot of folks actually weren't coming to the city. They didn't realize they needed a landscape plan review. And um, we, as a side note, we don't require a landscape plan when you do a full remodel of your front yard. So it just seemed to be that that seemed to be the way to go. Um, but a, a, a strong um, component um, with that is to enhance our community education strategy to make sure folks understand what's required in the front yard and um, so that it's not just code enforcement to follow up, but that we get the word out and make sure everyone um, realizes what the standards are. So these are our recommendations for dialogue. And um, the next step would be to come back to the Planning Commission um, with a draft of the guidelines, and um, you'd need to make a motion for resolution to move that forward. 
One other thing I wanted to ch quickly made mention is that this is the information that's on our website now, and obviously it's not, not you can't read all of it, but it is the city's attempt to um, get the word out to folks as it is. It's called Santa Ana Londa Garden. The links on the right, the blue hot links, um, one of them is our, our design guidelines that describes um, uh, how that landscape area uh, needs, to be, needs to play out, how much can be permeable, how much needs to be plant area. There's the existing handout for synthetic turf. There's a link to the Metropolitan Water District's um, uh, turf removal rebate program, which folks can still apply for, but as you might know, they're out of money right now. And there's also a link for convenience for the public to the uh, Parkway uh, Landscape Guidelines, which um, was authored by our Public Works Agency. So on that note, I'd be happy to um, answer any questions. Do have any questions for Melanie? Commissioner Bauer? Uh, Melanie, so uh, you indicated that you recommend uh, increased length from one and one quarter or one and one, one, and one fourth to one. one. I mean, why not two inches or a minute? It looks good. I mean, obviously our concern is that it looks like ash and turf. That's nasty looking. So you want it to be natural. We, we could do additional research on that. It, uh, from the cities that we did compare, they range from one and a half to one and three quarters. So um, we could do additional research to see you know, the science behind how much more beneficial it is to, to go higher. But we thought one and a half was a, a positive improvement from where we're at. Oh, you mean like vegetable gardens and such? Um, I wasn't, I'm not aware of that particular one, but I, I, I don't know that we actually have anything on the books that prohibits that to begin with. Oh, just to get that information out? If it is the desire of the Planning Commission to add that to the, gu to the guidelines and uh, what, before we bring it before you, we could do that, victory garden or vegetable gardens or edible gardens in lieu of landscaping uh, in the front yard, we could uh, certainly add that language for your consideration. I think it's appropriate in this sort of setting, especially in that sort of website, like Santa Ana the Garden, that you provide that information so the neighbors know We'll add that to the, to the draft that comes back to you. If, if I might ask uh, Commissioner Bauer, um, what, what do you say about corn, <laughs> big giant rows of corn in the front yard? Or do we want to limit? In other words, the reason I'm asking on that, not to, I like the idea, I don't want to patronize it. I'm just saying is that do we, in addition to asking staff to come back with some language, maybe also want to ask them to come back with some, some sort of standards that maybe certain things probably shouldn't be grown in the front yard? I mean, it, I'll just say from my own personal preference, I would hate to have my neighbor having rows of corn. I mean, I'm in California, not Nebraska. Just I, I think what might reg... <laughs> I guess I'm a landscape <laughs> snob, my bad. We could look into that uh, legislation a little closer from a landscape standpoint. Um, the rule of thumb is that the landscape material is supposed to be no higher than the, a front yard fence would be, so that would be three feet. Well, that, that would prevent the large corn stalks. In the right, but we can double check the legislation to see what allowances it made for. Any other questions? Any other questions? It would be through code enforcement, and right, and that's why uh, that's why it's it's a dialogue about the pros and cons of that. What we have found um, is that requiring a landscape plan, which we've done since 2009, we have a handful of folks that have submitted for landscape plans. 
um, because they don't know that they need to or for whatever reason. And so uh, I guess it's, it's and another example would be there's a lot of folks that are redoing their whole front yard and that may, their whole redos of the front yard may or may not meet our standards. It may be there's too many rocks in there, there's too much permeable and not enough uh, greenery, doesn't meet our standards. Um, but we don't require those to have landscape plans. So it seemed as though to treat them all the same was more appropriate. It's not ideal, but it, I, that's why we're, we're recommending that, that education. Why, why Uh, and no, if I, I guess may, in the if I may oh. answer this question, uh, actually requiring landscape plans is cost prohibitive for many family households. It requires uh, hiring a, a, a person to actually do the drawings and prepare, prepare them. And uh, in, in our community, much like a lot of other communities, that would be cost prohibitive. We, we f found it to be more reasonable to actually do an educational campaign and m make people aware of it, and then uh, allow people to switch, as people are switching from lawn to these different types of landscaping, through practice and, and uh, remember that uh, our code enforcement will not cite them the first time. We will work with warnings. This will be just a slow process that will not bring in a costly uh, undertaking to every household. Well, it, it may not be costly as long as you're doing the education process up front. If somebody's applying for you know, changing this out and then you go through the education process and if, and if the people say, yes, we understand, what you're saying, we understand the 50% rule. To me, that's that's okay, but sorry, but I mean, to sit there and say you don't need a plan and it's gonna be code enforcement's responsibility down the line to make sure that whatever they did, you know, has to be undone. I mean, that's gonna be more costly to the neighbor, to the to that individual if they have to go through the code enforcement process. The difference is that uh, when the code enforcement process goes, the code enforcement goes to the most egregious cases where something really needs to be undone, as opposed to requiring everyone to come up with a landscape plan and go through the permit process. Yeah, and and I'm, not, I'm not saying necessarily that you need a landscape plan. I'm just saying you need a plan to give these people with regards to their choice of doing this landscape and that plan is your education plan. Is that Commissioner oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, McLaughlin, sorry. if I can answer that question. We've, we have discussed this um, among staff, and we are looking at doing outreach programs not only to city residents and property owners, but also to um, the con local contractors and landscape designers to inform them of our policy so that once this gets into place we will be we will be doing that as well as as, as we have up on the screen right now this um, these links to what our landscape requirements are so um, we do intend to put the word out and we do have a plan for that educational program um, but as we as um, as uh, our director just stated, um, we do not we do not collect a fee for those landscape plans, and we cannot um, afford to do these landscape plans for free. And it, it just would be cost prohibitive for us. And I'm not I'm not I'm not saying that I'm not proposing that. What I'm saying is, if the if the landscape plan is too costly to the to the homeowner to do then what are we doing from a city's point of view to make sure that that, that, that homeowner, when they go to decide, I, mean, I, had, I had a neighbor down the street, 75 and 85 years old, and they wanted to replace their front lawn. They would have done 100% replacement of their front lawn. Mm -hmm. But they didn't do it because they, they found it was, too cost, it was too costly for them to do the project in itself. But you know, I can guarantee you they're not on computers that are gonna sit there and say, you know, oh, let me look up this link and everything else. It's not going to happen that way. Well, I'm just saying that if, if, the, if the person, if the contractor has to come in, then the contractor has to be given the training, and, the, and then the obligation is on the contractor to make sure that the homeowner understands what those requirements are and what, why, he, why they're doing what they're doing. I mean, that, that to me solves the problem up front. Making it someone else's problem down the line doesn't seem to be cost effective. Well, we, we do intend to have an educational component for the 
contractors, as well as for the neighborhood associations, as well. You know, so it will be. Um, we are going to try. We are going to put the word out, and we do understand that this is a problem. But this is our solu This is the solution that we've proposed at this point. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, are you suggesting that uh, making it a prerequisite for all contractors to actually learn our, uh, our, our new process and our new guidelines prior to doing this as a way of uh, replacing the landscape plan? Well, I'm not sure whether you want to do it prior to, but it would, I mean... In would, conjunction with? would be done. In, in terms of our procedures? I understand what you're saying. You're saying that, uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that instead of just putting off the problem to code enforcement later on, at least uh, put some of the requirement up front so that right. there's a, some level of clarity as to where people need to step in forward. And, and we could do that. We could put guidelines both at our front counter and we could put those online and we could uh, ask the contractors to check in with us and we can explain the guidelines to them. Well, I, and, I think you said, I mean, if I if I'm understood this, one of your slides, I thought you said that the, the contractor that does this kind of job has to be licensed by the city. Correct. Okay. Yes, and in some cases, people may not hire a contractor. That's really the They're case. They're probably not. I mean, some of them will probably yes. get their gardener to come in and say, hey, do me a favor, whack out my front lawn and put this artificial turf in there and, and just go for it. And somebody's going to sit there and say, yeah, okay, no problem. We'll take care of it. That's so, accurate. I mean, yeah. I mean you know, I, I'm just trying to you know, throw the process up in the front end and say, fix the, you know, make sure the fixes are in place and the controls are in place before they execute so that they don't get this costly situation that's going to be put on them with code enforcement. That's well taken. That's Sorry, a, very, I don't that's a prudent job there. Yeah, but <laughs> that's a prudent uh, recommendation, and I think we can put, uh, we can do a mass, massive outreach to right. make sure the word is out. Okay. I think that, that, you know, when I was thinking of the outreach, it's almost like the watering days and stuff. Well, somehow everyone figured that out, I, I, mean, I guess. I don't know. It went through most the water did, bill. Yeah. So most, most, most people figured that one out. So I guess if you're doing a similar thing, then they'll see that. Yeah, but your got, bill in some cases. Your bill had it. Yeah. You know, wow, yeah. you know, look at my It's bill. never perfect. I mean, people yeah, do stuff know. without building permits every day, too. So. I just have a yeah. comment. Yeah. Yes, sir. I probably will be in the minority on this, but I, I have a real issue with uh, telling folks with what they can do with their private property. Um, this, when someone's gonna build some new construction in our city, I understand you give them, we, we can kind of set guidelines before they build, but I, I just kind of take issue with, with uh, Big Brother gonna tell people how they need to landscape their front yards. You know, again, I may be in the minority on this, but you know, I live in Santa Ana, I don't live in Irvine. Um, and, I like I, I like our city, and, and and I think common sense is going to win out win the day here. But uh, you know, I just think that uh, when we start telling people how they're going to landscape their yards, you know, then what next? We're going to tell them what color they can paint their houses. Um, you know, I just think we're we're traveling down a a, a path that that I. I you know, uh, just patently disagree with, and I'm going to just say that for the record now that I, I, I don't agree with your with your guidelines. I will not support them as they as as what you're saying here now because I I, I don't think that uh, that the city should be uh, telling people uh, these sorts of things. Uh, just I, I patently disagree with it. So I just want to state that for the record now. And like I said, I may be in the minority, but. Uh, you know, I believe that uh, personal property rights are very important, and uh, this is usurping uh, the rights of, of, of people to do with their property as they see fit. So, well, that, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Um, help me understand. So these guidelines, the reason why they're before us is not because you guys had decided, let's go in there and regulate the front yards. This is coming down from the state, correct? Or at least the some of this. Well, the, uh, the reason we bring it back before you is that the state actually, in their legislation, said cities, make sure you're not prohibiting it. Right. And so we, we wanted to make, make sure that we were meeting state guidelines. And we, so we're just kind of affirming our, our standards, our guidelines, if you will. So we're affirming the ones that are on the books right now. From the state, right? Yeah. Or I'm sorry, our books here, but our, again, from our the state. consistent with the state. Excuse me if I 
just point of clarification the state isn't saying that only 50 percent of the yeah. the city's guidelines are saying 50 percent the state saying you can't prevent people from having it the yeah. city saying well we're not going to prevent them but we're only that, going to let them have 50 percent right. so it's, these are city regulations no no i understand uh, okay. it but it's it's because of state in other words it's like ab32 and then sb350 like you have this this idea of here's this limit or, or something we want to achieve and then here's a companion piece of legislation that's going to get into the nuts and bolts uh, minutia of it. The state law is not initiating us to have this conversation in a way. We're just, uh, it's a good opportunity because the state wants to make sure we're not prohibiting and we're going on record saying we're not prohibiting it. Okay. This is our definition of what's reasonable. The state requires us to have, they say if we're going to limit it, the limitation must be reasonable. Okay. And so we are coming to you now with the idea that this is a reasonable limitation. I mean, you know, kind of like what Commissioner Mill's saying as far as possibly being in the minority. I don't support synthetic turf. I, I, I think it's awful. I, I, it's kind of like a cell tower, you know, mono pine, might as well be mono turf. I mean, to me, I don't think, when you showed some of those pictures up there, the brilliance of the green, I mean, it's pretty obvious you would stop and go, is that real, you know? I, I'm not a big fan of it. I, I like the idea of, you know, the succulents and all the other drought tolerant plantings. I think that allows for a more creative and better way to address some of the issues that our state faces today. So, I mean, you know, I, I don't like the, the standards at all, but if it's just simply an exercise in affirming some sort of compliance with state law, um, I can't see any reason to. I mean, if I could, if I could vote to not have the synthetic turf, then that would be a different conversation. But since that's not the case, right, since it's not the case, then I, I, I think what you guys are presenting is fine. If I may, the bottom line is that uh, the, the state says you have to allow reasonable amounts of it. We have defined reasonable at 50%, which is more than my previous city where I worked with, which was 0%, and, and, then, and a lot of other cities. So that is the 50%. If the commission disagrees with 50%, that could be discussed. Uh, when we bring the item up uh, and we understand we took note that at least one commissioner does not want us to uh, put even 50% on it that the property uh, owners should have the right to put more but at, so far as I understand it we've had more restrictive uh, landscaping requirements this is less restrictive this is one step less restrictive than it has been in the past and I think as a, if I can comment here it's a guideline is just that. I mean, I'm, I kind of highly doubt there'd be someone with a tape measure going out there. But, but I think that, um, I think that the code enforcement is sort of complaint based. You know, sort of like our signage, and we were speaking about that at lunch the other day. And if a person completely covered their yard front to t front to back with synthetic turf with no other landscaping, um, on the one hand, I agree with Commissioner Mill. I love living in Santa Ana without a bunch of rules but I would be disappointed that that took place. And then I would also be disappointed if code enforcement came to some elderly couple or any couple that just spent $10,000 on what they believed to be a really nice landscape improvement, whether it was nice or not, in their eyes it was nice, and then say, hey, you got to chop out 50% uh, you know, of that or 20%. So I, so I think the outreach and education is gonna say to give someone Hey, you know, it's about 50%. In reality, you're probably going to have 50% anyway in, of green grass versus, versus planting areas. I think if you took a helicopter view of someone's yard. So uh, it seemed reasonable. I, 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 you know, I'm sympathetic to also not having a bunch of rules. So, so it's, it's like a double-edged sword on this one. But uh, that's, that's all I have to say. So can I just? Yes. Because you just brought something up. So what happens if somebody already has synthetic uh, grass in and they well exceed 50 percent well I can think of one right now that's uh, going through code enforcement it's so like it's complaint based usually and then code enforcement will research it and uh, act appropriately so it's going so it does go through code enforcement at this point in time no matter, I mean there's no there's no date back date that says if you put it in six years ago you know code enforcement can not can't enforce it. Well, this particular standard has been on the books since 2009, so I guess you know we could talk to legal. But in theory, if it was put in in 2008 before we had any guideline, might be there might be worth some discussion. Yeah. But we've definitely had it on the books since 2009. Okay, I mean, so that, therefore they're liable to code enforcement. But, yes. 
Is there any other questions or comments? Or? So we don't have any action on this. Just to work. Just a real quick oh, sure. Nellie, um, but we're really only affirm. This program is actually going to help because it's going to reaffirm the standards we already have in place for landscaping. So, right. And then this extra bit of guidelines for the synthetic turf will basically be the the new part of our our standards. So, but if we have this program and we we're out there, we're really reaffirming what we've already had on the books for a long time. So, right, this and outreach it's, is actually a, it, a benefit. It's a benefit because we're getting we're we're getting the word out afresh, and we're also going to be sharing the California friendly guidelines, which are newer. Um, so there's there's an opportunity to educate folks on if they're going to make that transition, be it synthetic turf or drought tolerant, how to do it with some great resources, how to tap into rebates when they're available. So it's an opportunity for us to be, have, have more to communicate to the public. We're offering more choices than we have in the past. Okay, I, I think it, I think it's great because I think that um, by by doing that, I think people would abide by. The standards, but in most cases nowadays, they just don't understand or don't know that they're even there. So I think this is going to be, you know, a good eye opener, and, and maybe it'll even encourage people that once they know this, what the standards are to to do more mm -hmm. landscaping right. you know, to redo, or redo, I should say. So we're looking forward to the challenge yet the opportunity of getting the word out that that education and the outreach. Mr. Mill. Yeah. For the record, I wasn't on the commission when they were approved, but I did oppose them when they were initially put. I also opposed the fence guidelines that they've put because, the, again, um, you're, you're impo I, I've been against them going back. The, uh, there's been rules that come, came to the city, and I've been coming down to the city council meeting since the 80s, and I opposed them then. So for the record, I was opposed to them before they were on the books. I wasn't here on the dais, and now I'm reaffirming that I oppose them now. Mr. Chair, so the direction that the only direction that we added to, to, to the discussion was provisions for edible gardens uh, that could be added to the front yard and uh, I guess consistent with the drought tolerance standards. So we will, we will work that language in as we br prepare the, uh, the, the guidelines for commission consideration in the future. Mr. McLaughlin. You just used the word edible gardens. What Corn. happens? Oh, he brought up corn. <laughs> what about wine? Vineyards? They're edible. Mm -hmm. I know they're edible. But they're they're edible. Con they're, I come from a culture where you <laughs> even eat the leaves. You eat them, that's fine, but <laughs> and, and they'll probably have to be along the wall so that they're not over six feet or not over four feet. Not over four feet? Remember, we talked about the four. Well, we're going to do a little digging on that, but the four, the four foot is the height of vegetation allowed other than trees and such, so. That addresses the corn. That's <laughs> yeah. Well, when we come back to you, we'll outline, that a little clear, <laughs> okay. outline it clear okay. for everyone. Mr. Bauer. And, and just for uh, your edification, it was actually the California Neighborhood Food Act, and it was passed back in September, actually. Now, I became aware of it last week. 2015? It was, it was, it was uh, signed uh, in September of last year. Any other discussion, questions, comments? Okay, thanks. We'll move on to excused absences. I guess no one's really absent, so we can skip that part. Planning manager updates. Um, we had, this afternoon, we had our first meeting of the um, design and urban design and design review committee. And they, the committee members look to add a project on First Street. It is a multifamily housing project that is going after TTAC funds, which are tax credit funds, and will be coming to you probably closer to April of this year, um, or March, someplace between March and April of this year. So um, that said, the other um, upcoming uh, things that you can look forward to from staff are we will be doing a work program, outlining a work program for you of the planning uh, divisions work program and um, explaining what we're looking for doing in the next year or so 
I'm bringing forward to you. And there's quite a bit, actually. Um, our director is very um, ambitious. Yes. <laughs> is, is that your official comment for tonight? Okay. Any other, any other planning department? No, and so that concludes uh, the cool. planning manager's comments. All right, commissioner comments. We'll start with Commissioner Becerra. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just looking at the agenda this week, I, I appreciate how staff addressed um, my comments from previous meetings as far as future agenda items. I mean, this is. Fantastic. I think it gives folks a chance just to, as I mentioned before, to see what's coming before us. So I think you guys did an excellent job on that. And with that, that's all I have. Thank you. Commissioner Alderetti, you have anything to say? No. Nope. Okay. Commissioner Verino. Um, I, just, I wanted to just talk briefly about something that Commander Gominski brought up. Uh, he made a comment that um, we don't, we have only a handful of entertainment permits that have been issued, but that we have quite a few establishments in the city who are practicing without them. And um, how do we? Yes, I that? actually spoke with the commander at the end of the meeting after he was leaving that uh, we, we need to touch base to find out where that is and if necessary, we'll take action from uh, the planning and building agency okay. from the code enforcement end. Yes. Yeah, we might it might be necessary for us to urge people to come and apply for yeah. their entertainment. So maybe moment. a task yes. force yes. or something yes. that, that takes it. Because I know that will generate revenue for the uh, for Well, the also it, it'll establish the new system that yeah. we want to. Uh, Absolutely. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair Mill. No, sir. I'm good. Good. Mr. Bauer. Uh, yes, just real quickly. I, uh, there's a, a, a number of neighbors have come to me uh, recently. Uh, live in West Florida Park, and a number of them have been very concerned about a, a property over an olive that's been being built. And in their mind, uh, they term it a, a McMansion. You know, it's a, it's not in keeping with the character of the neighborhood. And I know that's very difficult to prohibit that sort of thing because sometimes that stuff is just in the eye of the beholder. But I know, I think we talked about at least uh, when you came on board initially, Hassan, uh, that there were some measures that, particularly the neighborhoods, if they want to preserve the character of the neighborhood, they can, uh, there's some procedure that they could go about. And I'd like to take a look at that uh, a little more closely, perhaps. And um, I don't know if that's the purview of the Planning Commission, it probably isn't, probably the Historic Resource Commission, I would think. That is something we actually uh, intend to look into. Uh, as you know, uh, in the single family neighborhoods in particular, we're not looking into upzoning anything, but we're looking at um, the further fine tuning our design guidelines for <coughs> compatibility. Number one, we're going to come up with a very extensive definition of uh, compatibility in terms of design guidelines and what, we, what will constitute compatibility both in terms of size and, and character and architectural character, et cetera. But also, uh, one of the areas that we'll be looking at in the residential areas is that if there is a conservation overlay zone that could be put to, for example, there are areas that uh, the ho homes are predominantly single, single story and people might want to maintain and preserve that character. That would be a way to address that. So that's a tool that we will be introducing after the general plan, after we identify those neighborhoods that may wish to preserve certain uh, parts of their character and what, how we would be able to address those beyond design review. So that is very much in the forefront of our, our discussions and our, what we're, we're looking after. Um, in the meantime, we are hiring a new senior urban designer to join the staff soon, I hope. And as we do that, we'll be revisiting the design guidelines and compatibility is going to be very, very much part and partial of what we will be looking at. I'm just curious, why is that? Uh, I know this is an ongoing problem. I know in Washington Square, we, they had this same issue. A number of neighbors came to me at that, and I know uh, Commissioner Verino as well. Uh, so I know it's one of these hot button topics. I'm just wondering why that isn't a part, wouldn't be part of the general plan. You said it's going to be after the general plan. It is part of the general plan, but the general plan sets the policies. The, the, the actual uh, 
standards will will be either along with the general plan or afterwards in the code okay. and in the in the guidelines. So we have the general plan and we have the zoning code and we have the guidelines that we were creating at the same time. This cannot be the, you know the guideline the general plan could say something like every new development should be consistent and, and compatible with the existing neighborhood. That would be as far as the general plan goes. But how you establish that and how you determine that would be done through the zoning code and through the guidelines. I mean, is what's I mean, what is the city doing now? For example, I mean, I know like in Washington Square, that someone put in an empty, on an empty lot, put on a, a trailer. It was an empty lot. It was an empty lot, but I mean, it wasn't compatible in the minds of the neighbors, and I would agree. I mean, was, what, is there anything in place right now that would prohibit that? We do have guidelines, and in fact, uh, I'm just right now the, working with one of the case planners who is. Uh, telling an applicant that their homes are too large and inconsistent and incompatible with the neighborhood, with the applicant who wants to build what they want to build. We do have some guidelines, and I must uh, say that Santa Ana is pretty far ahead, uh, uh, b more than many other cities in terms of uh, at least addressing compatibility and neighborhood consistency. And there are some things that you have uh, adopted in the past. We just need to strengthen further and give the tools to the de decision-making authority, which would be the staff and then as an appeal body, the planning commission to be able to enforce them. I think that's the part that we don't, we don't necessarily have the teeth we need in some of our documents and we are going to d develop those as we go forward. Okay, great, fantastic. Sounds like you're on top of it. The only comment I had is I wanted to thank Karen for keeping me on the straight path with running the meetings. So, and we get our binders all the time, comes from you, so thank you very much for all that. So that being said, we're adjourned.